Now that expert discovery in the SEC versus Ripple case is concluded, we find ourselves in a bit of a waiting game. Let's talk about what the coming days and weeks may show us as far as what's going to happen and potentially a final outcome. We'll take a look at some of the venture capital flowing and the cryptocurrencies, and then we'll talk about a few other headlines rapid fire that we've missed over the last 24 hours that you might be interested in. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. Let's take a quick look at the crypto market before we dive in. We're green again, climbing back towards that $2 trillion mark at $1.94 trillion, up almost 2% on the day. Bitcoin over 44000 Ethereum just a hair under three k. XRP $0.78, cents. and as you round out the top 10 cryptos, you can see Luna, Cardano, Solana, and Avalanche. So some interesting movements there. And Luna, the big winner of the last seven days of the top cryptos. Look at that, up 66% in the last seven days. Quite the return to it as it tries to reach that $100 mark again. Now let's talk quickly about where we're at in the XRP case. So all the deadlines that we had been really waiting for have come and gone. So the motion for reconsideration has been addressed, the Easterbrook notes, and the deadline for fact discovery. So now we're just waiting for some answers. Will Judge Netburn rule uh, for the SEC on that motion for reconsideration regarding the Hinman emails? If she doesn't side with the SEC, will the SEC try and bypass her and go to Judge Torres? What about the Easterbrook notes from that Garlinghouse meeting with Elad Roisman? Will we get to see those or are those going to be protected? And we still have the big items, the motions to dismiss for Garlinghouse and Larson, as well as the motion to strike the fair notice defense. So there are still quite a few open things. It may be a few days before we start to see some action on those now that a lot of the briefings just came out last week. Now, the one thing that we do want to pay attention to is specifically on the timeline uh, per Jeremy Hogan, and this was in Finance Feeds, which I'll link in the video description. So there was a document that was uh, published a while back and noted, and he pointed out, uh, in case you had forgotten and I had, um, that there is a settlement talk to happen 14 days after the close effect discovery. That's part of what needs to happen here in the process. So the last settlement discussion, which happened a couple of months ago, wasn't fruitful. The next most likely settlement time would be at mediation. Potentially in favor of Ripple is the fact that Judge Netburn herself, who has seen all the documents in camera, will be hosting the mediation. She knows exactly what is in the emails, etc., and if I'm correct in that the SEC is the problem child here, that could make a big difference. A good mediator can really work miracles sometimes, he said. Obviously, uh, that will have a major impact if she has some insights there and can help mediate that discussion and maybe they can hammer out some kind of resolution. We've seen BlockFi with their settlement just recently and that maybe could give sway to both sides to say, hey, maybe it's time to put aside our differences and just come to the table and settle. Remember, Ripple as a company wants to go public. That's the path they want to go down. They're not going to be able to get to that stage unless they mend fences a little bit with the SEC. The SEC is the one they have to go through to get publicly traded. So this could be an opportunity for both sides to find at least some middle ground. So we'll expect to see something in the near future come from that. I hope we do get some public information about what the outcome, whether it was uh, fruitful or not, um, that would be very good for us to know. But per Jeremy Hogan here, best guess, a settlement could come in April or May at the soonest. So there you have it. Just an update there with what's happening on the timing. Now in AMB Crypto, citing John Deaton, uh, the Ripple executives really should thank the SEC for suing them individually. And the reason why Deaton says this 
is because the documents like the Easterbrook notes uh, are having to be produced or would have to be produced to meet the burden of proof required for the accusations that have been made against them as individual defendants. Here's his quote. By suing them individually, the SEC has made these notes much more relevant and quite possibly necessary. The DPP law is very favorable to the SEC, but the DPP can be pierced if the evidence is exculpatory and Garlinghouse has no other way of obtaining the evidence. Unlike the SBI meeting, Ripple could ask, ask SBI, its largest shareholder, what was said, and he says he thinks Garlinghouse wins this one. This is also the argument Matthew Solomon made in his document where he said this document set is unlike what happened with the SBI meeting with Hester Peirce and SBI because in that meeting it wasn't pertaining to an individual defendant like we're seeing here with Brad Garlinghouse. So more to come on this one. We're still again waiting on the decision from the judge as far as whether or not those Easterbrook notes are going to see the light of day. Now pausing for just a second as a reminder the Frank Cho Crypto Show hosted on Sunday mornings will be coming to you with our second episode. We'll be talking about an XRP uh, PL project that I think you'll be interested in and you'll have to give me some feedback and let me know uh, if that's something that you enjoy and want to see more of. We've talked about some in the past from Xquake to Xstick and so I think it will be a really good opportunity to continue to expand the topics we talk about especially in that format. So do make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on that episode coming up this weekend. Now, as a reminder, today is the first of the month, which is one of my favorite days because it's when I get my payout from Voyager. They're still offering their top cryptos aren't changing, right? DOT, 12%, USDC, 9%, VGX, 7%, uh, Polygon, Matic, 5.25%. And, and you can see on down the list, lots of options and great rates, especially on USDC. They're still offering down in the video description. $25 in free Bitcoin when you open an account and trade $100 in crypto. Uh, unlike BlockFi, which is not accepting new customers into their interest account program or Nexo, Voyager is still offering these. Now, I know XRP is not listed, but that's why I've talked in the past about Vald as a great option for XRP in particular. But Voyager, great rates and a great program there. Uh, check it out if you're interested. Now, venture capital continues to flow into cryptocurrency. Electric Capital, which is a smaller VC, has raised a billion dollars for two new crypto VC funds with long-term investing in public goods as the focus for the new funds. Uh, and they had been a smaller player, but now with this, they have a $400 million venture fund and a $400 million token fund. Their last fund was only $110 million, and that was announced back in 2020. That puts them into the conversation now with some of the bigger players like Andreessen Horowitz, who we've talked about before, with their ties to people like Bill Hinman and Paradigm. So really interesting to see this extra uh, push in, especially in the Bay Area with venture capital flowing in, uh, trying to grow out the various ecosystems, more investments. You can see some of the uh, projects that have been invested in. So I'll link this below if you want to see more on that as it just goes to show the interest continues to increase. That on top of the various other announcements we've seen uh, throughout the course of the last couple weeks from uh, AMC and Dogecoin to even Airbnb. I think their CEO was talking about how they want to explore crypto payments. It's getting to be more and more mainstream every day. And then finally, just here at the end, I wanted to point this out because I haven't talked about it uh, when it came out yesterday. Uh, it was later than when I was already planning my video, but uh, it is important. And I know it's been covered elsewhere, but Tranglo, we've talked about as being one of Ripple's partners with some key corridors. Now, Ripple's ODL service is available across all 25 corridors that they have available, allowing remittance providers to process instant cross-border payments without costly prefunding. 
So this comes after how successful their pilot program was when we talked about it back in September. 250,000 transactions worth about $50 million were processed in just the first 100 days. At the time this was published, transactions via Ripple's global financial network, RippleNet, originate from markets including Australia, Japan, the Philippines, and Singapore, with other markets to follow. Ripple it acquired 40% of Tranglo in 2021 to scale RippleNet and the ODL service. ODL leverages XRP to facilitate low-cost cross-border payments on RippleNet. Remittance providers using ODL will not need to pre-fund accounts, allowing them to maximize capital efficiency to grow their business. This is one thing I talk about a lot because of my own background working in corporate finance, but the ability to utilize this product to help your business to not have to pre-fund accounts to enhance your working capital to be able to plan when you send and receive payments without lag without hefty fees this is a huge boon for businesses especially small and medium-sized businesses that want to be able to grow and compete with bigger more established players the ceo of tranglo said our remittance partners want to enter markets as fast as possible at the lowest cost. ODL offers just that. They can start sending payments without locking in funds at different financial intermediaries, which can be costly and time-consuming. Remittance businesses that sign up for ODL also gain access to both Tranglo Connect and RippleNet, allowing them to better meet increasingly diverse payment needs. So it is very exciting to see more and more integration and proliferation of these product offerings across multiple remittance corridors across the globe. This will only go to serve the ecosystem even more and allow for further development because we'll have increased volumes. So this is very exciting. Uh, I look forward to seeing more announcements like this. This is a big one, but I think there's going to be many more to come, especially in 2022. But let me know what you think down in the comments below. I hope you found this information to be helpful. If you did, hit a like on your way out. It helps the channel a ton and make sure you get the information most important to you. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so I can keep you up to date on all the latest. We've got a lot more to come. This is likely to be a pretty busy month as far as announcements and updates in the case as we move through the month. So do make sure you stay tuned so I can keep you informed. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day and I will see you in the next one.